Right, the FAA will hold a safety summit later this month to discuss a series of incidents and mishaps in the skies. Here's the latest frightening episode. A Lufthansa flight from Texas to Germany was diverted to Dulles Airport last night after, as you can see, severe turbulence. It sent seven people to the hospital. Aviation expert David Susi is here again tonight. We call upon him all too often, and the panel is back as well. David, how did this happen? This was clear sky turbulence, not a storm, not a thunderstorm they were flying through. What is clear sky turbulence? Clear sky turbulence is just temperature changes. It's changes in the air temperature that creates a density of air difference. So that means that the wings, when they go through denser air, they lift more. When they go through more separated air or hotter air, they go down. They don't lift as much. So that's what happens in clear air turbulence is you'll go through a section. Very difficult to detect that unless someone else has flown through it first and said, hey, this is going to be bouncy. It's going to be rough. But if you go through a different area, if there hasn't been a plane through there in several hours, this can happen and something that pilots are prepared for. I want to talk about how they're prepared for that. First of all, David, have you, I mean, it sounds really bad. The, the passengers said that it felt like that moment where you're going over the tippy top of a roller coaster, that feeling where mm -hmm. your stomach, you know, is up in your throat, you're out of your seat, you know, things were hitting the, the ceiling. Do, have you heard of a thousand to four thousand foot, the passengers have different estimates, drop like, through clear yes. air turbulence? Yes, I have. There was an uh, investigation I did on a Chinese airplane that came into Honolulu when I was based in Honolulu with the FAA, and we did have a fatality on that one. It was a flight attendant that, that wasn't buckled in. They were just trying to get, they even knew the turbulence was coming, but she had, didn't have time to get into her seat. And when it dropped that far, now you, you talk about a roller coaster, and roller coasters are no more than a couple hundred feet. But this is thousands of feet. This is a lot more dramatic than being on a roller coaster, and it happens much more quickly. The problem is that you, when you think about the Gs, you hear people talk about the Gs when, when the airplane pulls back up and it pushes you down. So you can stand, your, your body can stand five or six Gs coming back up without you know, really making a problem. But the problem is negative Gs are just as dangerous, in fact, more dangerous, because if you go down at a quicker rate and you're being pulled up like that, the body can only handle about two and a half Gs before there's problems. So this could really have been a, a dramatic thing. And I think some of these passengers that were injured, even though you would think, well, maybe they didn't have their seat belts on or something happened there, but they were probably injured as well. Even in their seats, they could be injured with that type of a fall. And how do pilots handle that? Um, what they have to do is slow down the airplanes. And we, you know, we've been on this kick about what's causing these problems, what's causing the airlines to make mistakes, what's causing air traffic to make mistakes. And again, it all has to do with speed. You know, Southwest Airlines has just come up with a way to save five minutes on boarding because that's a big deal. If they can save five minutes on boarding, then that means that they're going to be able to put another airplane in the sky that day. So it's all about how quickly you can get people boarded, how quickly you can get them on there. Now, the pilot has the discretion to, once they take off, they can figure out how much speed they need to have to go across certain areas. If it's a prone area, if it's prone to turbulence like this area is, and it's a known turbulence area, and they could tell from the uh, temperature and the readings that they had in their, on their, they have shear detection on the airplane, that they can see that something's coming. So the plan for the pilot is to slow the aircraft down. And you think about how dramatic that would be. But if you get through that clear air turbulence quickly, it's, it's doesn't make it, be, it doesn't make it better. It's not like you could skim through it. It just makes it worse. It makes it, you're a higher speed and it goes in different directions quicker. So what you have to do is slow the aircraft down. But they can't do that. They're, a lot of, they're under a lot of pressure to get to that gate on the other end so that they can make it back. Everything is scheduled so tight that the pilots aren't slowing things down. They need to slow things down a little bit, just like we talked about slowing down how many airplanes take off at a certain time mm -hmm. so we don't end up with airplanes on the runway when others are landing. David, stick around. I want to bring in the panel right now. Um, Essie, I know you have shared with us that you've had a terrifying flight experience, um, a horrible mm -hmm. flight experience mm -hmm. where you had to mm -hmm. be in a very shaky flight and mm -hmm. they had to burn off fuel mm -hmm. before you could land. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. does that ever leave you after you have an experience mm -hmm. like that? Well, it was awful. Um, yeah, we, we lost hydraulics on, on takeoff. And so we had five hours worth of fuel 
that we had to just burn off. And when you lose hydraulics, you, you can't really control the plane. So it was dubbed the Vomit Comet. You can look it up. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't find out until I was on the ground just how dangerous and precarious this situation was when I got a call from um, the History Channel's show called Engineering Disasters. And would you be a guest? And would you come on and talk about your near-death experience? Um, Do you still fly? I flew that night. So when we landed, I got right back on a plane um, to get home. So I, I'm always the wet blanket in these, these stories, Allison, because I'm always like, yeah, but flying is still really, really safe. Okay, I mean, if you say I so, believe then, it. then I have to Yeah, but it. I've I've already, I've beaten the odds. I've already had my near experience, okay. I right? Like, so I, like I can say, I'm good. Lightning I'm good. will not strike twice. Well, God willing. <laughs> um, and Dan, do you, do you just meditate your way through these things? Well, I, I, I'm, whatever the opposite of a wet blanket is, I will represent <laughs> unbridled fear <laughs> on this panel. I have no problem admitting that I get scared quite easily, so... I would not have gotten back on a plane that quickly. And actually, can I ask a question of David? Yes, Am I like, yes I, I, course, This is your show. But David, uh, is it true, is S.E. Uh, right when she says that flying is safe? Yes, flying is very, very safe. It's much safer than flying in, or driving in a car, getting in your car, driving across town. You take 10 miles in a car, you're exposed to much more risk. And we could talk about risk and versus hazard later, but basically you're taking a lot more risks. You're exposed to a lot more in that 10 miles than you would be going cross Atlantic in, in an airplane. Vindication so for the SE Iron Gus I mean, Cup. Told you. <laughs> Can I ask Allison a question yeah. to ask David? Yeah. Um, yeah. Listen, here's, Let's go right to the here, Here's the reality. <laughs> Uh, why are we hearing about all of these near misses lately? It doesn't seem that in the past it was to this magnitude. No, I Every agree. time I turn on, right, the, the, the television, yeah. I'm learning about this flight almost landed on top of another. What well, is going on? David has told, I mean, part of it is what David just said, which is that they're, you know, trying to get more flights up and out faster. Coordinating. And Cutting quarters. What, yeah. what you saw there was... You had the airline industry in 2019. You remember when the world was still normal. Then COVID hits. Then it's, you know, a, a near full stop for the airline industry. They're hemorrhaging money. Um, people are, are getting paid. Some people aren't getting paid. Then uh, right now, they are having more flights, more takeoffs, more landings. Now, it's not just recovering from, they're exceeding 2019 which is, I don't know if that's a business model to make up for lost time or revenue, or if it's a travel model, my which view, John, everybody wants to fly. But the answer to your yeah. question is, and I'll defer to our, our aviation expert, is that's more planes on the same number of runways and the same number of air traffic controllers and the... It's more traffic, and that is more planes in the sky. I get that. You know, so there could, demand, there could be more demand. There could be more people who are going back to flying. But, I mean, there needs certainly to be more coordination. It seems to me that we have the technology to do this. We have the ability to do this. We have the expertise, like people like David, who know how well, to do this. I mean, we do so that's to, not an excuse. Sort of, we do have to upgrade our technology, which we talked to David about. But, David, I have an important question for you about this turbulence. Is it um, climate change related? Will we see more of that kind of severe turbulence? I haven't, I haven't, I don't think there's any direct correlation to that. You're going to ask me to make a political statement there, and I won't go there. But, well, I mean, just a uh, reality statement. Has, I, yeah, I just didn't well, no, know if we were it seeing that, more wind shear. Uh, no, I don't think there is. I think there's just as much wind shear as there has been. But again, it has to do with how fast you fly through that wind shear. And I think that has more to do with it. Could very well be, but I'm not a climatic scientist and I can't really tell you that. But the fact is that when you go through those wind shears, if you slow the airplane down and go through them slowly and not try to bounce through them, then that's what, that's what causes injuries. And they need to do a better job of monitoring that on their, and they have the tools to do that on board the airplane to see what's coming forward. You can't guess it all the time. All right. But certainly, this one could have been avoided. Well, remember, right. you know, this well, is regulated yeah, by the FAA. Yep. If somebody was going to force that, but you've got an agency that nobody disagrees is underfunded, understaffed, with uh, technology that's too old, and an administrator who hasn't been confirmed. Yes. So yes. We're, we're seeing a perfect storm. Yes, we do always come back to that every time mm -hmm. we have this conversation. But I'm just going to tell my pilot when I get on the plane, just slow it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just take it slow. That'll do it. Okay, that's what, that's what I'm going to do. All right, guys, thank you very much. Stick around.